Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naima Butler, Assistant Director of Employer Relations in the Office of CAPS, which is the Center for Academic um, and Professional Success. Today, we'll be hosting um, the Air Force Health Professions Scholarship Information Session. So I'm going to turn it over to the representatives um, and allow them to introduce themselves, and we'll go ahead um, and get started. We ask at this time if you'll please mute yourself. And then, of course, there'll be a time at the end um, for questions. Um, if they choose to also maybe take questions throughout um, the information session, but the chat box is also available um, if you want to type your questions in there as well. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Technical Sergeant Topolsky. I am a recruiter here in Orlando, Florida, and I have with me today uh, Technical Sergeant Clavy, and we also have Lieutenant Colonel Coles, who is the Senior Flight Surgeon for the Thunderbirds. So today we just uh, want to talk to you guys about the Health Profession Scholarship Program. Um, and, and just open it up for questions after we're done and just kind of uh, uh, just make sure you guys have all the information you need. Uh, just a, a quick rules of engagement uh, for this. Just make sure that you guys, um, if you guys do have questions, uh, make sure you're not bringing up any personal information such as uh, medical issues, law violations, uh, social security numbers, stuff like that. Um, as far as uh, Sergeant Clabby and I go, we cover the majority of Florida, all of Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. So if, uh, if you're in that area, you, we will be your point of contact. Now for the Health Profession Scholarship Program, uh, it is a, a great program. I just wanna to touch on some of the, the awesome benefits of it. Uh, the Health Profession Scholarship Program, it covers 100% of your tuition and that includes all your fees, textbooks, uh, supplies and small equipment as well. So you should have absolutely uh, zero debt um, if you go through this program uh, when you go through uh, medical school. You also receive a stipend of $2,430 a month uh, and that is just used for walking around money. You can spend that money on anything you would like, uh, which is really nice. And then we also have a $20,000 bonus for selected medical school applicants as well. Now, some of the main qualifications when it comes to the Health Profession Scholarship Program is that you must be a US citizen. Uh, if, you're if you're applying for the medical school uh, HPSP, uh, you must have taken the MCAT. Uh, you must be enrolled in, accepted to, or currently applying to a school of medicine in the United States. And then uh, you will be pre-qualified by one of the recruiters, which would be Sergeant Clavy or I. Uh, once we complete your, your um, pre-qualifications, uh, we will help you with getting uh, all your stuff for your application, helping you with your interview, and then ultimately meeting the board to, uh, to see if you are selected or not. And that is just, a real brief overview of the, the Health Profession Scholarship Program. Uh, what I want, would like to do now is turn it over to our, our guest speaker here, our uh, senior flight surgeon for the Thunderbirds, Lieutenant Colonel Coles, who can uh, tell you about his experience. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. So yeah, I, um, I did the HPSP program. That's how I got through medical school. Um, I'll just give you a quick rundown about myself and, and my path uh, to how I got here. So I'm the Thunderbird number nine. There's 12 officers on the team. And number nine is the doc. So I take care of the team, all the officers that enlisted and their families as well. Uh, plus I get to fly in uh, F-16, so it's a great job. Um, <clears throat> when I first started, um, I had uh, heard about the HPSP program and um, it was a great deal. I honestly, uh, I had a great time. I honestly don't know why more people don't take advantage of it. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, plenty of people do. And we were just talking earlier that um, uh, the, the, the number of scholarships here are always maxed out. So I'm grateful for that, but I think we could always use more applicants. It's a great deal. Um, I had gotten accepted to medical school. I went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock. And um, I walked into the Air Force recruiter's office and basically I just handed him my acceptance letter and said, hey, I wanna join the military um, and I just got this, what do you wanna do with that? 
And so real quick, they signed me up for the HPSP program. Um, I had to do an interview with a senior officer and um, I went through all the same qualifications, um, uh, verification that they talked about uh, previously. And so that was it. Uh, med school was uh, at least the financial aspect of it, the administrative aspect of it was um, pretty simple and straightforward for me. Uh, all my bills were sent directly to the Air Force. I never had to deal with any of that. Uh, I didn't have to deal with um, filing you know, for student loans or figuring out how I'm going to pay for the next semester or anything like that. And anything that is required by your curriculum, any uh, books, uh, supplies, anything along those lines that um, your curriculum says is a requirement for that class is taken care of. You simply send the receipt. Um, and it's 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 nice to not have to deal with any of that. Plus, uh, living in Lubbock, Texas, cost of living is pretty low. That I actually lived off of my stipend. That was enough for me to actually rent an apartment and survive. Um, so I didn't have to pull out any additional loans or anything like that just to make it day to day. Um, so it was a great deal and it just took away one more stressful element of medical school that I didn't have to deal with, and that being the financial burden and the administrative uh, pain related to taking care of that every semester. Um, I saw my friends around me who were, who were going the traditional route, either paying it their own or doing um, by student loans or whatnot, and I just I never had to deal with that. And that was great because in med school, um, you have plenty to deal with outside of figuring out whether you're going to be able to pay for it or not. Um, so <clears throat> I did a four year program. Um, they paid for all four years of my medical school and I served for four years in the Air Force after that. Uh, well, obviously I'm still serving, but um, I committed, I uh, completed my uh, commitment for after that four years. I was having a good time. I was enjoying my job. And so I just uh, kept on re-upping and here I am 11 years later. And uh, still having a great time. Uh, I still love my job. I love coming into work every day. Um, and so uh, that was my experience with HPSB. Um, actually, my first uh, year of residency, I did general surgery to start off with. And um, then after I completed that, got my license, finished my USMLE uh, step three, um, then I decided to go active duty and go into flight medicine. Flight medicine is a little bit of a different gig and I can talk to you about that, um, but you don't need a residency in order to do that. So I did that for about six years in flight medicine and figured out um, after that, that I wanted to go to a family medicine residency. So I switched from general surgery to family medicine and um, did that, that out at Travis Air Force Base, uh, just south of Sacramento in California and uh, completed that a couple of years ago and then got accepted to the Thunderbirds team um, my last year of residency. So I just went straight from uh, Travis Air Force Base um, in California to Nellis Air Force Base here in Las Vegas. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different options, a lot of different things that you can do in the Air Force Medical Corps um, that just are not available uh, in the civilian world. Generally, the civilian path is pretty straightforward. Go to med school, go to residency, get out and start um, clinic, start procedures, whatever. And then uh, flash forward 50 years later and you're retiring. Um, and that's fine, that's great. More power to you if you know that's your true calling or passion. But if um, you're looking for something that's uh, got a little bit more uh, divergence in the algorithm, if there's a little bit more pathways available, well, I wanna do this you know, training, I wanna go on this particular kind of mission. You know, do you want to go serve in Antarctica for a month? Great, we have that option available. Do you want to go and do some kind of, there's very cool uh, trips where they take people down to the South Pacific and they are a part of a team that um, identifies human remains for people who were lost in like World War II and brings them home. That's a great trip that a lot of people go on and have a ton of fun. You wanna do something a little bit more operational and serve with a squadron. Um, you can be a squadron medical element and serve with fighters or tankers or whoever and deploy. Um, or do you just, uh, you know, none of that applies to you and you're like, yeah, that's great. I wanna serve, but I don't wanna do all the, you know, that kind of little bit more crazy stuff. Then, you know, you have the opportunity to just serve in the Air Force and do what the Air Force paid you to do, a family practice doc, a surgeon, uh, anesthesiologist, whatever. There's plenty of opportunities for you to go and, and do that if that's your true calling and passion. Um, so I'm still around, I'm still here in the Air Force after I completed my um, HPSB uh, requirement, just because um, 
we just, we love the job. My wife loves it. We have a good time. Uh, we love the community. You make incredible friends that will last a lifetime. And then they get stationed in cool places across the globe. Um, and they invite you to come visit them. Like I had a buddy in Greece. Uh, hey, come out. Let's, uh, I want to show you around. So um, I have had a great time. Uh, I love my career in the Air Force so far. I'm probably going to stay for 20. And um, uh, it all started off with the HBSB program. And it just took a lot of the administrative burden away um, and a lot of the, the, the pain of, of figuring out how you're going to uh, pay for med school semester to semester. And I never had to worry about that. It was just gone. So it's a great deal. Um, what kind of questions do you guys have? Yeah, if you guys have any questions about um, what it's like to serve in the active duty Air Force, the HPSP program, um, or if you have any questions for the Colonel about his experience, you know, feel free to unmute your mic or put your question in the chat and we will be happy to answer it for you. I just got a question. Do you consider optometry or did I personally consider optometry school? Um, no, I was, I didn't personally, um, I'd always wanted to be a doctor, um, but uh, I've served with plenty of great optometrists and uh, I depend on them a lot since I work with a fighter squadron. I'm a flight doc um, and a lot of my community vision is obviously critically important to pilots. And so um, I depend on optometrists a lot to keep them, um, keep them seeing straight and uh, keep their vision intact. So I didn't personally consider optometry. Oh, does the program prefer MD over DO applicants or can either apply? Uh, it, I have served, yeah, there's no, there's no preference of one or the other. A um, bunch of my friends in residency, a bunch of my best friends are DOs and um, they're, they're MDs as well. There's, as long as you get your license, that's the critical aspect of it. There's no, I've never seen any preference one way or the other and I've served with tons of both. I'll tell you, my, my, I sometimes wish I'd gone to the DO school because uh, in flight medicine, a lot of my guys, when they're pulling nine G's in a jet, it messes with their backs all the time. So they are always love uh, when you, you can crack their backs. That's a, that's a very valuable skill in the squadron. For the right. optometry question, uh, we do have HPSB optometry uh, scholarships, <clears throat> if that's what you're asking. Okay. And then we and then another one, did you have to do any training for the Air Force while in medical school? And do you consider PA applicants? So um, there's a couple of questions. I'll get to that one first. Um, yeah, I serve with PA and NP all the time. Uh, we have tons of uh, mid-level providers like that and they help us out a great deal and they have great opportunities for advancement and leadership. Um, training in, during medical school, that's an excellent question. Generally speaking, no. For 11 months out of the year, no. They largely ignore you. Um, the, the, the priority is med school, get through med school, pass, get your degree. And, and then we'll start, we'll, we'll talk. However, comma, there's one month out of the year that you have to do what's called an active duty tour of some variety. Um, and this was, uh, when I did HPSP and, and you guys make sure and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's changed, but you have to do one month out of a year or at least four months out of your four years of medical school, you have to do an active duty tour. The first one generally is officer training, and that's in um, Montgomery, Alabama, Maxwell Air Force Base. And you go down there for a month, they teach you the basics of being an officer, how to salute, how to put your uniform on, history of the military, that kind of thing. Um, and so that takes a month. That's your first active duty tour. It's kind of nice because you're actually on active duty pay. You're paid as, a, as, as an active duty second lieutenant, so you're paid doubles generally. And then after that, you have uh, three other active duty tours that you have to fulfill. And usually those are spent doing rotations. Um, I did a general surgery rotation at San Antonio um, at Wolford Hall. And I did a flight medicine rotation actually at Travis Air Force Base, interestingly enough. And then um, we also had um, the option, I don't know if it still exists, but we had the option of, of it's basically doing a home tour my fourth year um, your active duty tours, uh, basically you stay at home and you are considered to be on active orders, but it is done so that you can study for your step test. So, um, not much change other than I was paid as an active duty second lieutenant. So like I said, my pay increased and, um, I just spent the whole month, 
uh, studying for my step exam. So those, with the exception of those four um, active duty tours that you have to do four months out of the four years of medical school, uh, they largely don't touch, they don't touch you, they don't bother you. The focus is medical school or dental school or whatever, get through that and then they'll talk. Obviously you have to stay in shape, you know, keep a basic physical fitness, um, don't break yourself, uh, that kind of thing. But as far as training otherwise is concerned, um, no, uh, minimal. And, and I had fun on my active duty tours, it was great. I love the opportunity to get out of town and go to San Antonio or go to, to California and um, or Alabama. And I had a great time, met some great people and, and I enjoyed it. So that was all the training that we had. Let's see. And then let's see, what are there? Is there the same opportunity available for me in the field of dentistry? Yes, there's HPSP programs for dentistry as well. And it's basically the same as uh, the medical HPSP. Um, do you have the choice of specialty after medical school or must you serve as what the Air Force chooses for you? That is an excellent question. So the answer is yes to both, actually. Uh, I know it's not, uh, it's not a great answer. So um, <clears throat> the Air Force has all the same or most of the same specialties in the, within the Air Force and the military as a whole as the civilian world does. Um, but you understand the Air Force is a system and we only need so many of a given specialty to fulfill the requirements for that system. So do we have dermatology? Yes, we absolutely do. Do we have various kinds of specialties, uh, surgeons, general surgeons, orthopods? Yes, fellowships? Yes, we have all of that stuff. Family medicine, you could go do uh, fellowships in sports medicine. You could do fellowships in uh, obstetrics, so on and so forth. Emergency medicine, all of it. We have almost all of the same thing. Now, some of the more obscure um, uh, specialties and fellowships, we generally contract those out. Um, but the Air Force is a system and it takes care, it's a system that takes care of its own people and we need specialists to do that. So we have a lot of the same stuff, almost all of the same stuff that you have in the civilian world. However, comma, because uh, we only need to take care of uh, our people and to a lesser extent our retirees as well, uh, there's a little crosstalk with the VA, a little treatment across um, organizations. You only need so many of them. So you know, how many um, endocrinologic based surgeons do we need? Well, not many. Uh, how many pediatric uh, neurologists do we need? Well, not a whole lot. So there are a limited number of spots for those uh, more specialized um, groups and you have to compete for those. Like you compete for anything out in the civilian world. Uh, it's the same thing. It's just the pool's a little smaller because we're not taking care of, you know, the country as a whole, we're taking care of um, Air Force members and their families. Um, we have a huge need for family medicine. So primary care, pediatrics, um, women's health, we have a huge need for those specialties. So we have a lot more of those spots available. And that's what you're doing is you're competing for a spot. It's the same thing as with the civilian match, you're competing for a residency spot somewhere out in, in, in the country. It's the same thing, just on a smaller scale. Um, of course, you're competing against a smaller number of applicants as well. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I don't know, I hope I answered it for you uh, completely, but yeah, basically, yes. Let's see what else. Um, yeah, good question though. <laughs> any, any other questions out there for us? It can be anything related to the Air Force or the scholarship. Yeah. So a lot of people, I'll, I'll just say that I have a lot of people question about um, what it's like being a, a doctor in the military uh, versus being a doctor in the civilian world or a dentist or a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, what have you, optometrist. And I will say that um, it, you know, everyone talks about the other side. The grass is always greener. Um, and it's, there are certain burdens that you have to deal with in the civilian world, and there's certain burdens that you have to deal with in the military world. And from what I gather, from what I've seen, talking to my buddies in the private sector, talking to people who have served in both the private sector and the military world, the overall level of burden between the two systems, civilian and military, is the same. The level is the same. The type is different. So it's just a matter of whether you deal with the burdens um, in the military world better than if you deal with the burdens in the civilian world. 
the grass is not necessarily greener. It's just different. <clears throat> um, some people don't like wearing a uniform every day. I love it. I don't have to think about what I'm wearing. Um, <clears throat> some people don't like having to take a physical fitness test every year. I think it's a good thing. It forces me to stay in shape. Um, it's something you should be doing anyways. Um, you know, some people don't like dealing with insurance companies and some people can do it just fine. They don't have a problem with it. I've never dealt with an insurance company in my life and not once in my career have I had to deal with that. <clears throat> I don't hire my own staff. Um, never hired staff. I've never paid overhead in a clinic. I've never had to worry about um, private practice uh, elements like that. Um, and some people enjoy doing that and more power to you. It's just uh, there's different burdens in each system. And it's a matter of which burden you deal with. But I, from everything I've seen and heard and all the people I've talked to, the, the grass is not greener on one side or the other. It's just a matter of, of which type of burden you enjoy dealing with more. Um, uh, another question that um, I remember uh, I got asked, or my mom asked actually, when I was a uh, young Lieutenant Calls and I was first commissioning into the Air Force back in 2003. And the first thing she asked was, um, are you going to send my son off to Iraq was a big deal back then. Are you going to send my son off to Iraq um, and put a gun in his hand and put him on the front lines? Um, the first thing any mom is going to think about with their son when they join the military. Um, and the colonel who was doing my uh, my commissioning ceremony, signing me into the military and commissioning me into the rank, he said, look, we have people to do that job. All right, we're about to spend a lot of money on your son turning him into a doctor. And there's not many people who can be doctors. And we're spending a ton of money on making him one. He is not going to have an M16 and be on the front line uh, slugging it out with, you know, the Republican Guard or whoever. Um, there are people who do that, and your son's not necessarily going to be one of them. So uh, that's a lot of misconception. A lot of misconception a lot of people have is that they're just going to go straight to a combat zone and they're going to be eating MREs on a tent on the side of the hill. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, will you deploy? Sure. You're going to deploy at least once. If let's say you serve a four-year tour, you get out, hey, more power to you. You served. Um, you've done your bit for king country and you served with honor. Will you serve? Will you deploy? Probably at least once. I love deploying. I have a ton of fun doing it. I, um, you get to focus on your job of being a doctor. You don't have to worry so much about the administrative element of it. Um, you meet a ton of great people. You see different parts of the world and you're exposed to all kinds of opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, myself, I kind of raised my hand for deployments and volunteered for a lot of them. So my first deployment, uh, straight out of the gate, I was with a 389th Fighter Squadron in Mountain Home, Idaho. We went to Bagram, Afghanistan uh, full up combat deployment. It was a hoot. I had a good time. I enjoyed it. I think it was a bit of a groundhog day because you're there for six months at a time, but I had a, I had a ton of fun. Uh, I met a lot of great people and I really enjoyed the mission. After that, I went to, um, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I went to Al Dafra air base and uh, that was a great deployment. Um, and we got to get off base and go tour like Abu Dhabi and tour Dubai. And I've been up at the top of the Burj Khalifa and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, we had a great time on that deployment as well. Um, and then, uh, we spent a month in Lodge's, uh, air base, uh, in the Azores, uh, uh, as part of like, that was our, our halfway point between the continental United States and the Middle East. So all our jets would fly for X number of hours and they would land in Lodge's. They would get a, a couple of days of rest and then they would take off back for Idaho. So I spent a month in the Azores and, um, I remember after being in the desert, and it's called the Burj, uh, the the Rub Al Khali, the empty quarter uh, desert in um, uh, Al Dafra. I remember getting off the plane in Lajes Air Base in Portugal, and there's so much green it almost made my eyes hurt. Like I hadn't dealt, I couldn't process that much green. I spent a month uh, there, and that was great. And then my third deployment. Um, the first half was at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, and that was um, that was exactly like you think it would be. We were supporting a naval mission there, and uh, great time, good flying, great mission. And then when we weren't at work, we were on the beach. It was glorious. And then I spent the second half of the deployment in um, Korea at Osan Air, Force Air Base, uh, just outside of Seoul. And also incredible perspective really opened my eyes to how uh, people live uh, with the threat of war each and every day 
the Koreans and they're under threat of war in a way that we just can't understand um, until you go there and you and you experience it. And it was definitely eye opening. And uh, I had a great time. It was a great mission there. And I was really, really happy to be a part of that. Learned a ton, met a bunch of great people, um, saw a bunch of incredible things. So <clears throat> that's been my experience uh, as far as deploying. Um, so yeah, will you deploy if you join the military? Yeah, probably if you at least once, most likely depends on what kind of military engagements or wars we're involved in at the time. Um, but I, I always raise my hand at the opportunity to go deploy, uh, but that's just me. Um, my wife, you know, she's able to handle it. The kids, they're able to handle it. Some people don't as well. Everybody's a little bit different, um, but usually it's a very good opportunity. Um, those are typical questions that I get about being a doctor in the military. A lot of times I get questions about like, do you have to like, uh, stuff along the lines of like, do you have to salute and yell, sir, yes, sir, and, and um, do you have to like full metal jacket type questions along those lines? And eh, look, you're a professional and you're working with other professionals. If I see somebody who's of superior rank to me, am I going to salute them if I'm outdoors? Yeah, of course I am. Uh, if somebody is uh, lesser rank than me, they're going to salute me and I'm going to salute them back. And that's about the end of the salute thing. Um, no, I don't drop and do push-ups. Um, that that doesn't happen, and we don't yell at each other. Sir, bracket every yes, sir. You're a professional, and you're working with other professionals. But those are, is is is, and you just have to be a doctor amongst um, other professionals. So that's that's my working relationship with those around me. Uh, Let me think. Those are a lot of the typical questions I get. Oh, I'll put in a plug in medicine. A lot of people, um, when they come out of red, uh, out of medical school, and I, so you go through four years of medical school, and you are, it's a whirlwind. Um, you're taking classes, you're rotating through all the specialties, and you barely know what you did yesterday, let alone last month. But at the end of that, well, actually, at the end of your third year, you are supposed to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. And I thought that was a little odd. Uh, that's a, a, a hell of a decision to put on somebody who's just trying to survive medical school. Um, and so there's a lot of people out there. I remember in my class, at least, there's a lot of people who are applying for residency, just kind of like, eh, I'm not sure if I want to push this button, but I'm going to because I have to. You don't have a choice. Um, or you could be a general, general medical provider, but not a lot of people do that anymore. So I will say that flight medicine provides you with some time to further mature and develop that choice of what you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, like I said, you just have to complete a intern year and get your license, finish your step three um, to come in and do flight medicine, or you can even be what's called a GMO, a general medical officer and work in a clinic. And that's it. You can do a transitional year. Like I said, I did my intern year in general surgery. A lot of people, they just do a year and whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then you come in and you can either be a GMO or a flight doc and you can serve for however long you feel the need to in that position. And you can further develop and refine and mature your decision of what you want to do for the rest of your life. Flight medicine gives you that opportunity. There's a lot of people in my class, and I can't imagine it's changed. There's a lot of people who were just really not committed to what they wanted to do, but they had to make a choice, or at least they felt they did. And so they pulled the trigger on something that maybe they really weren't passionate about, but by golly, you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life, man. So flight medicine and the Air Force in general, GMO, you have the opportunity to serve for a while, figure out what you want to do, go work with other people in a field that you're interested in, um, I, there was a psychiatrist I worked with at Travis Air Force Base. He's a forward colonel, loved psychiatry, had no idea he loved psychiatry in medical school. He was a flight doc for nine years. That's a little long for somebody to do that, but it's an option. You can do it. He did flight medicine for nine years before he figured out he wanted to be a psychiatrist. And now he's very successful and passionate about psychiatry, loves it, had no idea he wanted to be a psychiatrist when he was in medical school though. So you have that option to sit and develop and mature a little bit uh, as far as your decision making is concerned. All right.
question. Can you explain a little more about what the commitment entails? After you complete the four years post-medical school, do you owe any more service? Uh, great question. I'll tell you, um, for active duty service, and please recruiters, um, feel free to correct me, but uh, at the end of your four years, that's it, you're done. I had a lot of people who, uh, friends of mine, who they had bad assignments. And every, here's a little trick. Um, if you spend enough time in the Air Force, at least you, you serve multiple assignments, usually every three to four years or so, two, two to four years, you're gonna be moving to a different assignment. At some point, you're gonna have a bad assignment. That's just, it just is, it's, it's the law of the universe. Um, I felt bad because some of my friends would have their bad assignment, their first assignment, and they had a terrible impression of the Air Force. And I had, a, I couldn't blame them, but I tried to tell them, look, just stick it out. You're, there are good assignments out there and the bad ones are rare. Um, but there were plenty of them who were like, nope, I'm done. Or they just didn't like the Air Force. They didn't like dealing with the burden of the, they wanted to deal with the burden of the private sector. Hey, more power to you. You served uh, with honor and they served their four years and that was it, they were out. Um, I'm not 100% sure if there's any kind of a reserve requirement, but I don't, I think you go straight to inactive reserves after that. <clears throat> yes. That's correct, sir. So if you do four years of active duty service, then you would have four more years in the inactive uh, ready reserves, uh, which is which is not the same as the reserve. So you, no one is calling on you or anything for those. Uh, after you complete your four years of active duty, you know, nobody is calling you. Uh, you don't report to anybody. Uh, you don't have any obligations or anything like that. Uh, there is just that that slight possibility they could call you back if, um, if say like World War Three broke out or something like that. They they basically would call people in the inactive ready reserve before they would start a draft. I, I would think, but um, for the most part, once you do your your four years, that that's it. Yeah, and I think that inactive reserve they only call those people up in case of like an actual declaration of war, not a like a police action like we're doing in Afghanistan or Iraq, but like honest to God declared Congress declared war then they start calling in active reserve up. And that's generally the only um, instance that that would ever happen. So yeah, usually all the experience that I've had with uh, friends of mine, for whatever reason they got out, they served their four years and they walked away. So. One thing I wanna uh, say about that is the service commitment after you complete medical school, uh, the service commitment doesn't start until after your residency. So if you do four years of medical school, you go on to do your residency, your service obligation, even if you're in an Air Force residency, doesn't start until you complete residency, because that's our overall end goal is to get a residency trained physician. Now, if you do the GMO or the gap year that the uh, colonel was talking about, that does count towards your active duty service commitment, but the service commitment typically starts after you complete your residency training. Uh, one question for the, the colonel, uh, sorry to jump something on you or uh, uh, catch you off guard, but um, what made you choose the Air Force over any of the other branches? Because that's probably oh, yeah. something that a lot of people are going to have a question about. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> so um, I always knew that I wanted to serve. Um, I, you know, I wasn't necessarily one of the born of the 4th of July types, but I, I it, you know, I knew I had to do something for my country. It was just, uh, I didn't know what it was. I had no specific aims or goals. My family has long history of military service in my family, but the, that was about the extent of it. I just knew I had to do something. I thought, well, okay, how about this military? I'll scratch that itch for public service, and then I'll go off and, uh, you know, I, am, I wanted to do surgery at the time, like I said, and I'll go off and I'll do surgery and I'll make my millions in the private sector. Um, sounds like a great plan. And I went and started shopping myself around. Now, my dad was in the army. He was a nurse and ethicist in the army, served in Vietnam and Tonson. And my mom was an army wife. So here's my shameless plug for the Air Force. Um, <clears throat> so I started shopping myself around once I got accepted to medical school. Um, the army certainly, you know, continuing on in my dad's uh, legacy. There's a certain draw to that battalion surgery. That's really, really cool. Uh, if you ever read, we were soldiers once and young, uh, uh, Colonel Halmore, he talks about um, the, the, the service of his battalion surgeons who helped them out a ton. Uh, so there's definitely a draw for that. Sure. Who wouldn't be interested in something along those lines? The Navy, of course, there's romance in sailing across the globe. Every Just about every boat, certainly the large ones, they have their own um, doctor stationed on that boat. And you can take care of the entire boat and ports of call and seeing the world and sailing all over. Um, certainly there's there's a draw for that. Who wouldn't uh, wouldn't feel that? Um, 
And I knew I was going to, uh, you know, make my way over to the Air Force. And so I had gone to an Army recruiter and man, they were going to sign me up right then. They're like walking in the door. They're like, here, sign on the dotted line. I was like, I was thinking to myself, you guys don't, I could be an axe murderer and you guys haven't even figured that out yet. You're just trying to sign me up. Um, I was on my way over to the Navy recruiter's office and somehow out of the clear blue sky, an Air Force recruiter called my personal cell phone, which is a number I didn't really like give out much. And I answered the phone and was like, hey, okay, that's great. Yeah, I'm on my way to see you guys at some point. I'll make my way over there. But how on earth did you guys get my my personal cell phone number I'm like oh yeah your mom called us and uh gave it to us and that's that so yeah she said you're interested i called my mom and i was like you gotta be kidding me like you gave a recruiter my my personal cell phone number and she was like yeah i want you to go join the air force i know you're gonna join the military do the air force i was like mom you were an army wife and don't you have any esprit de corps and so on and so forth and you serve with dad in the army and she's like yes I was an army wife. That's why I'm saying join the air force. I was like, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. She's like, go to an army base and go to an air force base and look around at the difference in the housing and the facilities and how they take care of people. And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to join the air force period. And Paya. And so I was like, Meh, well, okay, that makes some sense. And um, walked into the Air Force recruiter and, and they they vetted me. I was really impressed with the fact that they actually vetted me. They said, oh, you want to join the Air Force? That's great. Let's start the process. I was like, aren't you going to try and sign me up like the Army guy did? Nope. Here, you got to have an interview. We have to review your records. We have to go through this and then the other. We got to make sure that um, you're fit to serve in Air Force material. And they actually spent some time evaluating who I was. And I'll be honest with you, I was kind of impressed with that, that their organization the organization obviously that I now belong to was took um, care in figuring out who was actually joining and was going to be a provider and taking care of providing medical care for uh, the Air Force as a whole and their family members. So that was my path to joining the Air Force. Um, yeah, good question. Anyone else out there? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. We do have our email addresses in the chat, though. If you do have a question after this is uh, after this this meeting, you can always reach out to us at our email address. Also, you can go to airforce.com and click on apply now. That is uh, another quick way to uh, get put in our system and for us to reach out to you so we can help you with your questions and help you with uh, uh, your pre-qualifications and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Um, by all means, I'm happy to answer any questions and keep an eye out for our team. I think we have two shows uh, coming up in Florida this year. Hopefully they don't get canceled with uh, the Rona. But by all means, uh, happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you guys for, for joining us. Lots of great information and thanks to our students. Um, the information will be recorded. So Kelly will make, well, it is being recorded. We'll make sure that um, everyone gets a copy of it. And then it's also going to be posted on our YouTube channel as well. So thank you. Thank you for having us.